think Andy has put up with me more than most people I know, failing perhaps my wife. Morning. Morning. Are you alive? Yes. Well, you'd be very glad to know this morning that I'm, I'm just the warm-up act. Okay. I've actually bought, um, well, actually, I, I invited someone and, uh, and then a, a very good friend, and she bought her husband as well. So this is Fanula and Andy. Okay. And uh, just... So I first um, came across, I didn't actually come across Fanula, I came across her, um, her food, actually, before anything else. She was one of the cooks for the mustard seed, the, the, the kind of meal, community meal that we do on a Wednesday night, and she became known as Meatballs, um, <laughs> because she does the best meatballs in the world. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she's still famous for that, but then um, I knew her sister Andy before that, and then Andy introduced us to Fanula, Fanula and um, she's just... She's a diamond. You'll find that out for yourself, okay? But um, so she's going to just share a little bit of a testimony later on. But this morning, I would like you to turn to Psalm 46, the, the scripture that Martin uh, gave to Hannah this morning. Do you like my new Bible? Yeah? Do you know what it says about a man when he has a big Bible? It says he's, he's, he needs glasses. <laughs> it's got bigger print. <laughs> If you, so if you thought it was about authority, okay, it's about the fact that I can read it better. But uh, it's also about the fact it's the only version that I've got, the NASB, and I wanted to read from the NASB this morning. Uh, there are many different Bible translations. It's hard to translate from Hebrew and Greek into English because translation is not an exact science. And so I like to have a few translations around so that I can actually get a, a broader grip. But this, uh, the NASB and the New King James versions are probably the most literal translations that we have. So um, there's some language in here that I like this morning. So this is Psalm 46, and we're going to read just the first seven verses. Starts at the beginning for the choir director. It's an introduction to the psalm. A psalm of the sons of Korah, set to Alamoth. That's a tune in case you were worried. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations make an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He raises his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, a quick question for you this morning. Have you ever stood somewhere? Actually, let me put it a different way. Does anyone like storms? Yeah? Hands up if you like storms. Lots of thunder, lots of lightning, serious lightning. Okay. Um, who doesn't like storms? Okay, it's a few nervous people around here, okay. So some people like them. But those of you who like storms, what's the best place to watch a storm from? Safety. Safety. Yeah? <laughs> Safety is always that there's a certain sense of exhilaration in watching something that is way more powerful than you and actually highly dangerous, but knowing that you're safe. Okay? And, um, and there's a, a, a sense about this scripture where the writer is writing about something that is dangerous, but he's writing about it from a safe vantage point, okay? Um, years ago, I watched a video, a short video, of people caught in the tsunami following the earthquake in uh, Fukushima in, in Japan. And there were people who had found high ground, and they were videoing. In fact, that's how the video arrived, because uh, they caught the whole thing on video. But not everyone was safe. There were some people that were running, and some people were standing there watching and videoing, and others reacted differently. Some were just weeping helplessly because they were seeing homes destroyed, but they were also seeing people not safe, running desperately, some being swept away. And then there were others that were running back down the hill into the middle, into the eye of the storm, trying to find a way to help people up the hill. And this is a, a kind of a scripture about finding God's safety in a world that is being shaken. There is comfort in it. 
But my experience is that safety is not a place where we're immune from pain. If you are a human being, if you have a heart, you might be in a safe place. But if you watch people suffering, it's hard. And very often, there's a, a particular friend of mine called Mary, and um, God really delivered her from a lot of mental health issues. She was in torment for a good deal of her life. She was a right mess. And she met Jesus, and he transformed her. And he gave her a clear head, a clear thinking. But she, when she comes to Mustard Seed, uh, and she, because loads of the people there are suffering from severe anxiety and mental health issues, she can't sit there often without weeping. Because she stands in a place of safety and deliverance. But she sees what people are in. There's an acute awareness. Does this make any sense to anyone? You ever feel like that? Sometimes as a Christian, it's hard because you feel the pain more when you see people who are lost. Because you were there once. There's no kind of pride in saying, well, we're safe. Let, you know. I remember once a guy um, who established this big church or he was part of a big church in America. And, and he was asked on... Um, on this TV thing, someone said to him, how's the church going? And, um, and he said, it's amazing. You know, we have a massive car park. We have a brand new building. It's worth several million. And, you know, we have uh, 5,000 people every Sunday. And they, they said to him, what about the community around the church? And he said, well, the community is going to hell, but the church is great. You see, I don't, I don't find it easy to have that kind of heart. And yet... That is the place of the writer in this, in this psalm. And I want to just go through it a few steps at a time. Okay? It says here, right at the beginning, God is our refuge and strength. There's a reason that God's our refuge and strength. is because there's never a time where he is stressed or out of control. There is a never a time, there's a great deal of pain that he feels because he, like us, can stand in a place and look at the lostness of life. But there's never a place. You see, this God, the God who we worship, is the same God who laid the foundations of the heavens and the earth. There was never a before, there will never be an after. Sometimes people say, well, who made God? But the problem is, God was before all things. He made time itself. There was no before. So there is never a situation where he is concerned about his ability. You know, even our parents at their strongest sometimes go, ah! <coughs> your parents will know that. But God feels the pain, but he's never out of control. It doesn't mean he's in control of everything, but he's never out of control. God, that God is our refuge. Well, where do you run when you're feeling shaky? You run somewhere that's safe. You run somewhere that nothing shifts. And sometimes we run from our fears. Sometimes we run from our family. Sometimes we run from work. We run from all sorts of things. Sometimes, it sounds a bit schizophrenic, but you're running from yourself. Anyone ever feel like that? You just think, I wish I wasn't the way I am. And you feel like you want to run from who you are. And it says here, God is a refuge. He's a place to run to. So... September has been hard, honest confession, okay? Come back from holiday. Suddenly, all of the stuff that you ought to have dealt with in September is there waiting for you when you come back. And it comes at you thick and fast. Bang, bang, bang. I need a refuge at times like that. My garden has been my refuge. Usually at half past five in the morning or six in the morning before anyone else gets out of bed, that's been my refuge. The kids have been in the house. Bethany's been home. Ben's been home. They brought friends with them. Their friends are home. Hannah's around. The house is not necessarily a refuge, but the garden. I can sit there on the table. Not on the table, but at the table. <laughs> and God comes. And I wait on him. He's my castle and my strong tower. And he's a place where we find rest. I remember years ago when uh, we lived down in Hampstead and I was running a small church down there. And um, we were running in flame as well. And uh, our house, a little two-bed flat, and there were four of us living in it. It's not too bad. Lots of people live with worse 
but try preparing a preach or a sermon of, in, in any way or preparing anything in that kind of setting. And there's a lot, my favorite place in Hampstead, right by the heath, is not the heath itself, but a little bridge that goes from the road across to the heath. And it's my favorite place is because the rain doesn't get underneath the bridge. And that's where I used to sit and prepare. I used to take my Bible and sit there. It was my refuge because my God was there. My place of peace. My place of rest in the middle of chaos. So he's our refuge. It says God is our refuge and strength. And, um, and when we retreat into our Father's house, as in God's presence, something happens. You see, this is just me. I don't know about the rest of you, but when I go there, sometimes I feel like I'm running from so much stuff that's chasing me. There are problems I don't know how to deal with. There are people who are opposing me. I don't know how to answer them. Sometimes, as I say, I'm running from myself. I flee into his house. But I don't sit there. I come back out again with a sword in my hand. Ever been chased by someone? Ever have a, have a, a picture for a moment of your enemies hunting you down? And you run into this castle. You don't sit there. God strengthens you in that place. And you come out with a sword. He gives you the strength to endure. You see, God doesn't just protect us from danger, but he gives us strength to face our enemies. And we have many enemies. You know, not necessarily our battle is not against flesh and blood, but we have all sorts of issues in life. Some of you have health issues. Some of you have family issues. They're your enemies. They rob you of peace. But God gives you strength to go back and face them again. And God is a refuge and a strength. And I love this bit. It says he's a very present help. Ever got on a phone to someone and listened to them? You've got a problem. Maybe it's an IT problem. Best get on the phone to Andy if you've got an IT problem. But if you've got an IT problem, you ever get on the phone to someone and think, just get off the other end of the phone. Come here and sort it out for me. Because sometimes what we need is not advice. We need help. You know, Caroline is, uh, she loves gardens. She's not an expert garden, but she loves the church garden. But she's always asking me, what do I do here? What do I do here? And do you know how many people there are in a church to give advice about how to do a garden? Loads. Everyone knows how to do stuff. But just um, maybe beginning of this year, she found someone, many of you know her, Georgina, who said, I can help you with that. And Caroline just stopped getting stressed about the garden. She just rested because Georgina came and worked alongside her. You see, that is the thing that we achieve, that we get through Jesus. Jesus died to remove our sins. He died and rose from the dead to bring us into relationship with God. But he brings us into relationship with God because he gives us, Jesus says, I send the comforter to you. The Holy Spirit comes and lives with you. And he is the comforter. And that word in Greek, um, I don't know, how, I'm going to say it wrong. Forgive me, you Greek uh, people here. But uh, parakletos, okay, means, it, it's hard to translate into English from ancient Greek. It means literally one who comes alongside not someone who gives advice. So, you know, someone said to me years ago when I became a Christian, he said, the best thing about advice is it's usually harmless. What we need is not advice. We need a paraclete. We need someone to come alongside us. And God doesn't send advice. He comes himself. God sent his spirit to live in us and to be a strength for us. I remember years ago, and you probably heard me say this before, I used to play rugby at school, and I was pretty bad at it. But we had a guy on our rugby team, a guy called, um, oh man, my brain's just gone dead. Ever Everard, that's it, Everard Thorpes, okay? He was, he, look at Dan, okay? He was 16 and bigger than Dan. Okay, about the same height and nearly as wide. Okay, and we had a great strategy on our rugby team. It was get the ball to Everard. And I can't tell you how it felt when I was like facing a line of forwards. Okay, and I heard Everard Thorpe's behind me. Kingham, with you! And I knew it was a simple pass. 
and then they would be stretching off the parts of the opposing team. He could run like a freight train. Okay. That's who we carry into battle with us. Not Everard Thorpe's, but the one who flung stars into space. Our ever-present help. Ever-present. Not just yesterday, but ever-present help. And then David, uh, sorry, the, writer, the psalmist here shows us why we need a city of refuge. Though the earth change. Can I just ask a, a simple, honest question? Who likes change here? If you ask people who likes change, it's usually the young people who put their hands up, okay? Because they want to change what the older ones are doing, all right? <laughs> But my experience of life is nobody likes, everyone likes change when they're doing the changing. Nobody <laughs> likes change when it's done to them. If you came back to your house and someone had remodeled it while you were gone without asking you, would you be impressed? <laughs> Only if they'd done what you wanted them to do in the first place. You see, the writer here, the psalmist says that though the earth change. And the rude reality of the life that you and I live in is nothing is solid except him and his love, his faithfulness, his holiness. Nothing at all. And the most stressful times, well, I mean, psychologists tell us that stress comes, you know, some of the worst stressful times are moving house, everything changes, a divorce, okay, for children, a marriage breakup, there are so many things. When things that look like they should not change, suddenly they're gone. I remember my dad dying and my mum recently as well. Very similar emotions. I, there was a bit of me that rejoiced because they were free from pain and they're with Jesus. And I know that without a shadow of doubt. But there was a stake in the ground that my, anchor, my, my life was anchored to that had been there ever since I was born and it was gone. And I can't describe how it made me feel. I can't describe sometimes how it still makes me feel. I'm not sad. I'm just shaken, if that makes sense. And when you find out that something which you had trusted in is gone, then it's shaky. And so David says, or the writer of the psalmist here, it's not actually David, says that this is why we need a city of refuge, because nothing else is certain. Last week of the summer, I was at Cornwall, um, just having a bit of a break down there, and I love the cliffs at Bude. They're absolutely beautiful. But they're not permanent. And that's the language here. He says, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. You see, there's one thing that I could tell you about the cliffs in Cornwall. They're doomed, I tell you. Because the sea is inexorable. It just keeps coming. And my, my nephew Toby was saying to me, he said, uh, look at that house. It was this house with an incredible view out, of the, out across the ocean. He said, I wonder how much you get for that. And it was right on the edge of the cliff. Probably not much, view or not. It's times, it's days are numbered. Let me ask you a question. Who's built a sandcastle here? Come on, confess. You've all built sandcastles. How many of you expected to find it in the morning? <laughs> None of us do. Because the sea's like that. The tide is inexorable. You see, we need a safe place. And the language of Scripture is that nothing stands against the inexorable march of God's purposes in history. The sea in Scripture talks of God's judgments, His holiness, the fact that he will demand an accounting doesn't mean he's a finger-wagging judge. It means there is a time, a limit time, limited. Very often in the scripture, we use this word in the Greek um, that I'm going to get wrong. And geros, I think it is. We call it, we would say kairos in England. It means that there is a time. When we use the word time, the time has come. It's an opportune time. Time doesn't go on forever. Things are shaky, but he isn't. Now, I'm going to stop there. Because I want you to meet Fanula, because she's had to find a refuge, a place of safety. And um, I wanted to tell you 
her story because it's she's in the middle of it like we all are in the middle of our stories yeah or do you want me to put it on the stand Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, I'm condensing quite a long testimony, so I um, hope this makes sense. Um, I'm the youngest of three sisters, born to a very lovely but very strict Greek Orthodox parents. Sundays we went to church, but we were never really told what we believed in. I just remember being told to keep our heads down, do what the priest said and don't talk, especially me because I really love talking. I was scared of God. The church was full of icons with scary eyes that followed you everywhere. So keeping my head down was really not a problem. I was told that God was very judgmental, that he saw everything. And if I did anything bad, he'd know and I would definitely pay for it. So with this in mind, I thought, well, if I keep out of God's way, then maybe he'll keep out of mine. God was definitely not my number one in life, but I did know he was always there. I grew up within our community. We couldn't really mix with non-Greeks and was told it was a definite no-no to marry a non-Greek. Well, my sisters did just that and both married English boys, so the pressure was on me to marry a Greek boy and have lots of Greek babies. So I married young, aged 22, to a lovely guy from school, Andy. He's over there. Um, <laughs> um, we had the big Greek wedding, but sadly the babies never came. I won't bore you with all the details, but we tried everything. Hospital treatments, alternative therapies, prayers and pilgrimages. I even climbed a mountain barefoot to get to a monastery meant to be miraculous for fertility. But it didn't work. And then I had to go back up, but this time on my knees as penance. And that didn't work either. I even got attacked by a goat. Do you remember, Anne? Yeah, I did. <laughs> After nine miscarriages, I was skint and miserable. I'd let everyone down. I was a failure. I was told on countless occasions that I was cursed, that God could give me a family if he wanted to, but that he didn't because I wasn't worthy. After hearing this, and especially from the priests at church, I definitely wasn't that interested in God. But again, I knew he was there, but just obviously very angry with me. I was also aware of a very cruel voice that kept popping up in my thoughts. It was always there telling me I was unworthy, a poor excuse of a woman and a complete waste of space. Through all of this, I lost my lovely mum and dad, countless family members, my lovely in-laws. It was just non-stop. All I knew was loss, but something else was going on. My health was failing. I was in pain from head to toe. I was continually coughing. Yet again, I sought help from the doctors, but after countless tests, they found nothing. I was fed up and tired. I couldn't get anywhere as I was constantly gasping for breath. This went on for years. I'd actually had enough. Then one night in 2016, I did what I never did before. I went to my room, got on my knees and cried. Please, Jesus, if you're real, then either take me to be with you or send me to hospital of your choice to make me better. Whatever it is, just help me. That night I collapsed at home. I'd had a heart attack. I was rushed to hospital, but I still remember everything the surgeon said in the theater. My heart was swelling, I had two collapsed lungs, shadows over my kidneys, no oxygen and the highest of blood pressure. He said, this lady shouldn't be alive and I don't know for how long. I was shocked, was I really gonna die? Well, obviously I didn't die, but something did change. My sister Andy, who's a prayer warrior, came into critical care, threw a Bible at me and said, right, that's it, the enemy is not gonna take my little sister away from me. We are gonna fight this with Jesus. Now, she had lots of faith, but what was she talking about and who was this enemy? I actually thought she lost the plot, but I went with it because she was so passionate, I actually believed it. So we prayed together every day. We looked up healing scriptures. And what I noticed was that Jesus never turned anyone away. He healed everyone. And he was so loving and compassionate, the opposite of what I was told. Physically, though, I was getting worse. The doctors couldn't pinpoint what was wrong. One night at hospital, I was so exhausted from all the tests that I cried out to Jesus again. And in an instant, the room was filled with the brightest blinding light. Then I was hugged, the best hug of my life. I didn't see anyone, but I had a little feeling who this might be. And I finally fell asleep. Next morning, the doctor came in. They finally found what it was, a very, very rare, extreme autoimmune condition. I needed chemotherapy and fast. I was sad as I didn't want to lose my hair. 
But again, we looked up scriptures and came across Mark 16. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my names they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I had six rounds of chemo with minimal hair loss and never felt sick once. I still to this day read that scripture over my medication every morning. It's amazing as I still have no side effects, even when I'm told I should have. Soon I went home and life was great. I also finally had the energy to do my favourite thing, go for long walks, very, very long walks. Four years passed and I was enjoying life. The condition hadn't gone but was under control. Then one night I had a vision of Jesus. His back was covered in open wounds and his feet were bloodied from nails. I didn't know why I was seeing this, but I found out the next night. I woke up in agony. The back pain was unbearable and I was paralysed on the right side from the knee down, leaving me unable to walk. Covid restrictions didn't allow me to go to hospital as I was classed as extremely vulnerable and I wasn't allowed any pain relief as they reacted with my medication. So I was stuck in bed with Andy and my sister caring for me. All I wanted to do was walk. I finally got to see the doctor and his diagnosis was bad. He said I had a, a rare flare up of the condition and the effects were permanent, that I would never walk normally again. But this time I was different. I spoke straight back to the doctor with the authority Jesus gave to me and I said, I belong to a God who heals and I promise you I will walk again. Yeah. He looked at me the same way I initially looked at my sister. He thought I'd lost the plot, but I didn't care. I drowned myself in the Bible and two scriptures jumped out at me. One was the story of the lame man at Bethsaida. Jesus asked him if he wants to be made well. If he does, then get up. And secondly, he Hebrews 11, which basically says, believe even though you can't see it. I started acting healed, even though I wasn't. I tried to walk, I kept falling over, but Jesus said, get up, so I got up. The pain was bad, I didn't care. My foot wouldn't move, but I kept blessing it in Jesus' name. Jesus gave me the authority to trample on snakes and serpents, and that's what I was doing. He said, if I'm healed, then I'm healed. Three years later, and after much perseverance and prayer, I'm walking again, and the doctors can't believe it, but I can, because anything is possible with God. I even did a 10K walk for charity, but surprise, surprise, that enemy reared his slimy head again, telling me I'm a fool and an embarrassment trying to walk. I swiftly told him to go in Jesus' name, and he soon disappeared. That loser gets too much airtime for my liking, and I've only got time for Jesus. For me, the Bible used to be a book of stories. Now it's my life's manual with instructions and guidance. It gave me comfort when I was sad and disappointed, wisdom because God showed up when I was reading the word, helping me to understand him more, and strength when I felt like giving up, helping me to persevere, and allowing me to connect to Jesus and go deeper into a relationship with him. Picking up the Bible is the best thing I've ever done. It guided me to surrender and release total control over to God. And that's when real peace came, because I love him and I trust him. I know miracles come in different shapes and sizes, and most of the time they aren't always what we expect. But believe me, I'm healed. Not quite on the outside yet, but definitely on the inside. There you go. I did tell you I was just the warm-up act. (laughs) Let me read Fanula's last text. Sorry, Fan. (laughs) Just finished my appointment. Unfortunately, the levels are up and they think my treatment isn't working. They're baffled as to why I show no symptoms. Woohoo, that's our Jesus. Anyway, I know I go by God's word, not theirs, so I'm leaning on Jesus and here's to more miracles. God bless. And it said later on, just about five minutes later, morning, sorry to disturb you, but I thought I'd let you know that after seeing the consultants yesterday, I jogged up Parliament Hill to rebuke what they said. <laughs> I, th- I threw in a bit of Habakkuk too. Makes for a good recipe. Have a blessed day. I'm off to work. <laughs> there is a city whose streams make glad. The, that, sorry, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. See, there is a city that cannot be shaken, utterly unshakable, because it has its foundation before the world was ever made. 
it has its foundations in the love and the faithfulness of God. That never changes. There is a city, and it's built, and it's open. Do you remember what Fanula said? I knew that Jesus never turned anyone away. You see, there's a city of safety in a world that's crumbling. And Jesus has flung wide the doors and welcomed anyone that would come in. He's made a way through the cross. And he welcomes us all. That's his city of refuge because it's his city. And I love the fact that um, it says outside the world is crumbling and the world that we're living in. You don't have to look far to see what's going on. There are so many things that people thought would never change. Regimes fall. Governments topple. The earth quakes. Yet, there is a city. And there's a river. You see, the waters that the world is afraid of that make the mountains crumble are also in the city. There's water in the city as well. God has given us a river there. And it flows. And I don't know if you know this, but if you read through the Bible, you will see all the way through. I mean, it's written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. And yet so many people in it saw exactly the same thing. When they were, God showed them in a vision, a city. Not a city on earth, but a city in heaven. Jerusalem was modeled on it. David built his temple on it. All of the things that were built in here that we see on earth were built because people could see what God had prepared in heaven. There was a city that God had built that would never be shaken. A city of eternity for all those who want to go there. And the doors are open. But there's a throne in the city, and God sits on it. And I love it. I love this passage here. That's why I particularly chose this um, version. Because it says, let me just try and find it again. I've lost it. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. Not place, because it's plural in the Hebrew. You see, every heart that opens up to Jesus, every person that says, you come on in, whether they get the vision or the, the, the sense of a hug from Jesus that Fanula got, everyone's experience is different. But every heart that opens up, every heart that is exposed to him, becomes the throne room of God himself. Jesus comes and sits on that throne. And when Jesus sits on the throne of your heart, something happens. A river bursts out from the very roots of your being. That's why Jesus said, anyone who believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Because their heart becomes the throne room of God. Their body themselves, they become the city. The city that we're talking about is not an earthly city. It's not a fantastic church building. It's not a great car park. It's nothing like that. Because the city is made up of us, people. How do you build a city? How do you build a kingdom? One brick at a time. That's why our passion as a church is not to make ourselves better, but to bring people in because everyone whose throne, whose heart becomes the throne of God, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And it's not just a river either, streams, individual streams. Just have a look around for a moment. Everyone's different. Most of them are a bit weird, to be honest, but... God poured out his spirit on the church. Different gifts on different people. Some receive prophecy, some tongues, some the gift of interpretation of tongues, some gifts of miracles, healings, all sorts of stuff. The church is made up of streams that flow into one river, and that river gets deeper and deeper and deeper everywhere it goes. So, just for a moment, maybe you want to close your eyes. Don't have to, it's all right. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, bring joy. Do you need refreshing this morning? Because God has made provision inside the city for your heart. You may have been on the run, fleeing, terrified, struggling running from yourself, running from enemies, whatever. As you come into that place where God sits on the throne.
He releases streams to make glad your heart. Let's just wait on him just for a second, and I'm going to hand back to the worship team. Heavenly Father, you promised us the Holy Spirit. It's not my gift to give or anyone else's. But Jesus, you said you'd give him. We've heard a story this morning about that river bursting into Fanula's heart. We see the joy on her face. Would you refresh us this morning? Let the river of your presence flow. Spirit of the living God, just come. If you want to receive from him this morning, just maybe hold your hands out in front of you. Just tell him. I'm coming to you, Lord. You're my place of refuge. Strengthen me. Give me your joy. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive Him. If you've come this morning and you know that you've never opened your heart to Jesus, you might be a fan. You might think He's great, but you've never said, come and sit on the throne in my heart. I'll step out of my own chair and let you rule. Just tell him that this morning, as Fanula did. Tell him he can come. Heavenly Father, please just have your way among us. Move. Gently touch those that are wounded this morning. Father, where there are those that have put their trust in other things and the shaking has been too much, draw them, Lord. Put your hand down and rescue them. Draw them into the safe place, the place of your presence. Steady the hands that give way.